Football is an act of theatre, and the FIFA World Cup is the biggest stage of all. It is where stars are born, legends are made, and eras are defined. Going into the 1958 World Cup in Sweden, few people outside of Brazil had heard of a 17-year-old boy by the name of Edson Arantes do Nascimento, or Pelé, as he had been nicknamed by his school friends. The young Pelé started the tournament, both injured and benched, before making his first appearance in the final group game against the USSR. Pelé proceeded to score Brazil's winner against Wales in the quarterfinals, a hat-trick against France in the semi-finals, and a brace against Sweden in the final. In the space, quite literally, of just 10 days, Pelé had gone from being an internationally unknown schoolboy to being almost universally regarded as the greatest footballer on the planet, and potentially, the greatest player ever to have played the game. It is hard to have that kind of radical overnight transformation these days. The world has become a much smaller place due to television and the internet, but still a star is born at every FIFA World Cup. And in today's video, I wanted to take a look at the most notable breakout star from every edition of the world's biggest sporting competition, the backstories behind those players, and how their careers panned out following that World Cup breakthrough. To clarify, this doesn't mean the best player or the star man at every World Cup, like Messi in 2014 or Maradona in 1986. They were already legends of the game at the height of their game and fame. No, I mean stars that were really born, in a global sense, at the FIFA World Cup. Players who went into the tournament as one player and came out of them as something quite different. And also just a quick note, since I might struggle for Getty images with some of the players, if that is the case, I will just include some random photos from the 1990s. Here is the biggest breakout star from every single FIFA World Cup. 1930. Francisco Vareo. It doesn't get talked about much these days, I've no idea why, but the average age at the 1930 World Cup was very young. There were only 16 players at the entire tournament over the age of 30, France's oldest player was just 27, and the average age of the Yugoslavia squad, who beat Brazil and reached the semi-finals I should add, was just 21. Finalists Argentina was still among the youngest teams at the tournament, with a median age of just 24, and their youngest player was a certain 20-year-old named Francisco Vareo. Capped once prior to the World Cup, Vareo was a surprise inclusion in Argentina's opening game against France, he scored in their next game against Mexico, and the only game that he missed was the semi-final due to an injury, returning for the final against Uruguay. Following Vareo's outstanding tournament, he was offered huge sums of money by both Genoa and Napoli to go to Italy and play in Syria, but his parents didn't want him to leave Argentina. Vareo ended up signing for Boca Juniors instead, where he became the club's all-time record goalscorer. But his story is even more remarkable than that. Vareo started out as an 18-year-old, as a defender at Gymnasia, moving into midfield at 19, and then becoming a forward at 20. In 222 games for Boca Juniors, between 1931 to 1939, Vareo scored 194 goals, before being forced to retire at the tender age of only 29 due to an injury to his knee. Vareo, who lived to the grand old age of 100 and became the longest surviving player from the inaugural FIFA World Cup, joked during his late 90s that he would be forced to come out of retirement if Martin Palermo overtook his goal-scoring record at Boca. Following his premature retirement from football, Vareo went into coaching and then politics, but was dissatisfied with his impact in both fields, and said that he never truly recovered from the bitter pain of losing a World Cup final. An honourable mention must go to Pablo Dorado, who was the youngest member of Uruguay's 1930 World Cup winning team, and who scored the first ever World Cup goal against Romania, and also scored in the final against Argentina, and made several unofficial teams of the tournament. His heroics saw him signed by River Plate, but sadly, Dorado's career ended even more prematurely than Vareo's, also through injury, at the age of only 26. 1934. Edmund Conan. 
three of the greatest pre-war footballers, and arguably still, three of the greatest players of all time full stop, namely Giuseppe Meazza, Leonidas and Joseph Bican, were all fairly young going into the 1934 World Cup. But whilst Miazza and Bican were already huge stars before the tournament began, and Brazil going out to Spain in their opening game prevented Leonidas from making an enormous impact, although he did score a consolation goal in that game, a young German named Edmund Conan was to make this tournament his own. Aged only 19, Conan was Germany's youngest player at the World Cup, and had only won one cap going into the tournament. Yet, on his World Cup debut, Conan scored a hat-trick, and the first perfect hat-trick in the history of the World Cup no less, as Germany beat Belgium 5-2. He added a fourth goal at the tournament against Austria in the third-place playoff, prompting Werder Bremen to come in with a bid for him, and to offer him a lucrative deal. But the transfer was blocked by the DFB, since football was still supposed to be amateur in Germany at the time. Conan went on to spend virtually his entire career with the Stuttgart kickers, and his tally of 27 goals from 28 caps for the German national team has since been bettered only by Gerd Müller. That's despite the fact that Conan went three and a half years without playing any football at all, from the age of 21 to 25, owing to his cardiophobia and his crippling anxiety around other people. 1938. Jose Parasio. My favourite inclusion in this entire video, Jose Parasio was a fantastic forward with an incredible goal-scoring record. But it's not for that reason that he is my favourite inclusion. Today a part of Brazilian folklore, Parasio was from a poor background, he was semi-literate, and he could barely sign his own name. The youngest Brazilian at the World Cup, uncapped and three years younger than anyone else in that squad, the 20-year-old was renowned for both saying and doing things that made him the butt of many jokes. Parasio took binoculars with him on the ship that took Brazil to the World Cup, telling teammates that he wanted to see the equator up close. Another time, Parasio lit a cigarette at a petrol station before throwing the still-lit match on the ground, when his teammate, Martin Silveira, Jumped back and asked what on earth he was doing, Parasio responded, Sorry, sorry, I didn't know that you were superstitious. Parasio's brain might not always have been the sharpest as a youngster, but his feet certainly were. In Brazil's opening game, which was his international debut, Parasio scored twice in a thrilling 6-5 win against Poland after extra time, and he scored again for Brazil in the third place playoff against Sweden. Despite scoring prolifically for both Botafogo and Flamengo, Parasio never played for Brazil again after 1938, aged only 20, and he served as a volunteer in the Brazilian Expeditionary Forces during World War II. Gula Zengler and Ernst Wilamowski earn honourable mentions, but both were much bigger names and more established internationals than Parasio going into the World Cup, Meanwhile, Leonidas, whose impact was limited by Brazil's early exit in 34, would be the star man in 38. 1950. Joe Geichen. The World Cup took a brief hiatus between 1938 and 1950 due to World War II, which has to go down as one of the worst world wars as far as I'm concerned, but boy did it return with a bang. Brazil hosted but were humbled by inaugural hosts and winners Uruguay in a game known as El Maracanazo. Young Carl Eric Palmer became an overnight sensation for Sweden with three goals in two games. Meanwhile, Estanislao Bazora took the tournament by storm for Spain. But it was Joe Geichen who became the World Cup's ultimate breakout star. The United States took a bunch of ragtag amateurs to the World Cup in Brazil, and Geichen wasn't even American at all. Born and raised in Haiti, who he had already represented internationally, and only having moved to the United States to study at Columbia University in 1947. Nonetheless, Geichen, who entered the World Cup as a Haitian overseas student and little else, would exit it as a global icon. Having scored the only goal of the game as the United States beat England, in quite possibly still the greatest World Cup upset of all time. After the World Cup, Geichem was signed by Racing Club de Paris, and he spent the next couple of years in France, before returning to Haiti and becoming a Haitian international once again. 
tragically, in 1964, a day after Haitian dictator Francois Duvalier declared himself president for life, Gaitjen's family fled Haiti, fearing reprisals as members of their family were opponents of Duvalier's. Joe stuck around, never having been interested in politics and assuming that he would be safe as a notable sporting figure, but Duvalier's police arrested Gaitjen, most likely torturing and killing him over the next month, whilst he was still only 40 years old, though his body has never been found. 1954. Horst Eckel. A less morbid inclusion, Horst Eckel only died recently, almost exactly a year ago, at the grand old age of 89. The oldest surviving member from the Miracle of Bern, Germany's 1954 World Cup final win, against the might of Hungary's golden team up to that point, Eckel was just 22 years old when the World Cup began. Nicknamed the Running Miracle, Eckel's iron lungs and relentless running shocked the world in Switzerland, as his tirelessness typified a German team that emerged victorious against all of the odds. Eckel was much more than just a runner though, as he illustrated at the World Cup, coming as close as anyone ever did to marking Nandor Hidaguti out of a game. After the tournament, Eckel was sidelined for a year through injury, but he returned to win 32 caps for West Germany, solidifying his legendary status at club and international level with Kaiserslautern, and retiring to retrain as a teacher, a job that he stuck at until his retirement from the profession in 1997. 1958. Pelé. I suppose there was a bit of a spoiler for this one during the introduction, not that there would have been too many of you who wouldn't have been anticipating it regardless. Pelé's 1958 World Cup breakthrough is the greatest breakthrough not just in the history of the World Cup, but in the entire history of the sport, and there has not been a better teenage footballer either before or since. Pelé's talents were already well known in Brazil and certainly in Sao Paulo, where Pelé had scored 41 goals in 38 games the previous season as a 16 year old. But for the rest of the world, it was one hell of a shock. Pelé's talents were otherworldly, decades ahead of their time, and the sport, let alone Pelé's own life, would never be the same again. It should be said, Pelé wasn't the top scorer at the 1958 World Cup. That crown belongs to Just Fontaine, who still holds the record for the most goals ever scored at a single World Cup with 13. The French international, who was actually from Morocco, was a breakout star in his own right at the tournament, having won his first cap in 1953 and only actually starting for France at the World Cup due to an injury to their first row centre forward weeks before the tournament began. 1962. Florian Olbert. There were no absolute unknown quantities who took the 1962 World Cup in Chile by storm, at least as far as I can tell, but Florian Olbert's international standing certainly rose significantly at the tournament. Age 20, Olbert was already a star in Hungary, having averaged almost a goal a game for Ferenc Varos over the previous four seasons but playing behind the Iron Curtain, most outside of the country had seen little of him. Hungary won their group, in which Olbert scored the winner against England and a hat-trick against Bulgaria, making him the World Cup's joint highest scorer. Numerous clubs tried to sign him over the years, most notably Manchester United, but Olbert was never allowed to leave the Hungarian People's Republic. So he spent his entire career at Ferenc Varos, where he scored 256 goals in only 351 games. Four years later, he made the All-Star team at the 1966 World Cup. Honourable mentions go to Yugoslavia great Josip Skoblar and West Germany's Karl-Heinz Schnellinger. But I think that both were already stars, more so than Albert, before that World Cup began. 1966. Franz Beckenbauer. I was tempted to go with North Korea sensation Pak Du Ik for the 1966 World Cup, given that no one knew anything about the North Korean team going into that tournament, they surprised everyone, and Du Ik was their star man. Meanwhile, the likes of Elias Figueroa, Tostau, Jeff Hurst, and Martin Peters all went from being highly rated footballers to bona fide greats at that specific tournament. Nonetheless, all were overlooked because of Franz Beckenbauer, Der Kaiser himself, who had just one Bundesliga season under his belt prior to the World Cup, yet he was Germany's star man. 
So good was Beckenbauer, then playing in central midfield and aged only 20, that Alf Ramsey felt the need to sacrifice England's best player, Bobby Charlton, in the World Cup final to man mark him out of the game. As it happened, Beckenbauer had been given the exact same task, so both players just ended up shadowing each other and did next to nothing all game. Beckenbauer went on to become a sweeper, defining that role, and becoming both one of the greatest and one of the most decorated footballers of all time. 1970. Tiafilo Kubias. There were a lot of things that were special about the 1970 World Cup, which was the first to be broadcast in colour, and one of them was Tiafilo Kubias. The 21-year-old Peruvian, who played his club football for Alianza Lima in the country's capital at the time, and had won just three caps for Peru prior to the start of the tournament, ended the tournament being heralded by Pele as his successor. Given that Pele had just become the first player to win three World Cups, and still the only player, and was universally recognised as the greatest footballer to have ever lived, that was no small praise. Kubias lit up the tournament with his skill, ingenuity and long-range shots, most notably from free kicks. Only Gerd Muller and Jairzinho scored more goals than the 21-year-old, as Peru made it to the quarterfinals, where they lost 4-2 to eventual winners Brazil. But Kubias still managed to find the back of the net in that game. Kubias joined Basel in Switzerland in 1973, and later starred for both Porto and the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. Widely regarded as one of Latin America's all-time greats, Kubias was at it again eight years later, at the 1978 World Cup, where he was only outscored by Mario Kempes, and to this day, he has the highest goals per game record of any midfielder in the history of the World Cup, and he is also the joint highest scorer of free-kick goals at the World Cup. He averaged 0.77 goals per game, in case you were wondering, and that is despite the fact that he went three games without scoring a single goal in his final World Cup. 1974. Emmanuel Sanon. The second Haitian to feature, despite the fact that Haiti themselves have only ever appeared at one World Cup, which is quite impressive, Emmanuel Sanon followed in Joe Gaitjens' footsteps by moving to the United States, though only after achieving World Cup stardom, rather than before it in his case. The greatest Haitian footballer of all time, Sanon was just 22 years old, he was still playing his club football in Haiti, and he had won just one cap when he went to the 1974 World Cup. Though Haiti lost all three group games at the tournament, Sanon scored both of their two goals, including one against Italy, which was the first goal that Dino Zoff had conceded in well over a thousand minutes of football. Following the World Cup, Sanon was signed by Belgian club Bearshot, where he would star for the next six years, before seeing out his career in the States with the Miami Americans and the San Diego Soccers. Sanon is still Haiti's all-time record goalscorer, having scored 37 goals from 65 caps, and he went on to manage the national team from 1999 to the year 2000. Sadly, like Gaitjen, Sanon's life was cut tragically short by pancreatic cancer in his case, whilst he was still only 56 years old. An honourable mention must go to Vladislav Zmuda, who won the Young Player of the Tournament Award at that World Cup. 1978. Antonio Cabrini. One of the game's all-time great left-backs, Antonio Cabrini was Italy's youngest player at the 1978 World Cup, and he was totally uncapped going into the tournament in Argentina. Nonetheless, he went straight into the Italy team for their opening game against France, and his calm but committed defending ensured that he wouldn't be dropped, not just for the rest of that World Cup, but very rarely over the next nine years. Cabrini won the Best Young Player Award at the finals in Argentina, and went on to become an Italy and Juventus legend. Following his retirement, Cabrini briefly became a politician, joining the Italy of Values Party in 2009, which claims to be an anti-corruption party. It strikes me that being an anti-corruption party in Italy is a bit like being an anti-baguette party in France. It was never really going to work out. <laughs> never mind, who are we to judge at this point? 1982, Pierre Litbarski. A diminutive second striker, number 10, and occasional winger, Pierre Litbarski certainly wasn't unknown going into the 1982 World Cup. 
he had scored 18 goals in 21 games for West Germany's under-21 team, if nothing less, and 15 in 34 for Cologne the previous season. But few expected him to play such a starring role at the World Cup in Spain, having just turned 22 years old. That is exactly what Litbarski did, though, as part of an incredible front three alongside Klaus Fischer and Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, scoring against the host Spain in a 2-1 second-round victory, and in West Germany's famous 3 all draw with France in the semi-finals, and making a lot of people's teams of the tournament. Litbarski spent the bulk of his career playing for Cologne, with whom he scored the winning goal in the 1983 DFB Pokal final just a year later, and he went on to win 73 caps, for West Germany. An honourable mention goes to Manuel Amaros, who starred in that same 3 all draw that France went on to win on penalties. 1986. Josimar. There's something special about Brazilian fullbacks, and few have been more spectacular than Josimar at the 1986 World Cup. Josimar was relatively unknown, even in Brazil, going into the 1986 World Cup uncapped and playing for mid-table Botafogo at the time, and it was only due to an injury to first-choice right-back Leandro that he received a call-up to the squad at all. When deputy right-back Edson was also injured in training, Josimar was handed a shock start in Brazil's final group game against Northern Ireland. Josimar scored one of the all-time great World Cup goals on his international debut against Pat Jennings, no less, and in his second game, he only went and scored again another absolute beauty, this time against Poland in the round of 16. Josimar had gone from unknown to global superstar virtually overnight, but as he put it, the blondes came and the training went following his newfound stardom. Josimar, as a result, only went on to win 16 caps for Brazil, despite being named by FIFA as the best right-back in the world in 1986 as a 25-year-old, and his career was effectively finished before he turned 30 years old. 1990. Robert Prozanecki. An absolute genius with a ball at his feet, there was very little that Robert Prozanecki couldn't do, other than quit smoking. Though he was already a star man for Red Star Belgrade, when Italia 90 came around, age 21, it was in Italy that Prozanecki introduced himself to the world. One of a handful of brilliant young players in that Yugoslavia squad, along with Alan Boksic, Davol Shuka, and Darko Panchev, Prozanecki didn't start a single group game for Yugoslavia, and he didn't even make the squad for their second game against Colombia. The only game that Prozanecki did start was Yugoslavia's quarter-final defeat to Diego Maradona's Argentina, in which he taunted and teased the South Americans as the best player on the pitch. Prozanecki also succeeded where Maradona failed, converting his penalty in the shootout, but as he was one of only two Yugoslavians to do so, the country was eliminated. Prozanecki won the Young Player of the Tournament award, largely because of his performance against Argentina, and a year later, following the breakup of Yugoslavia, he signed for Real Madrid. Prozanecki went on to star for Madrid's rivals Barcelona also, Croatia, who are now Dinamo Zagreb, and famously Portsmouth for a single season, as well as winning 49 caps for Croatia. 1994. Mark Overmars. Mark Overmars was already held in high regard, age 21, going into the 1994 World Cup, but the tournament no doubt elevated him to another level. At that age, Overmars was freakishly quick, he could play in any attacking position, and he seemed to absolutely love taking defenders on and beating them. He played in all five games for an excellent Netherlands team that was only defeated 3-2 in the quarterfinals by eventual winners Brazil, and Overmars was crowned as the best young player at the World Cup. Three years later, he was at Arsenal, and three years after that, he became one of the most expensive players of all time, at that time, in a move to FC Barcelona. 1998. Michael Owen. I recently saw Michael Owen taking a fair bit of flack for saying that he would be worth the same as Kylian Mbappe at his age if he were playing now. And whilst Owen is, quite rightly, a figure of ridicule due to his persona and his punditry, in that sense, he is absolutely right. 
I think some people forget, or just never knew, that Owen won the Premier League Golden Boot and the Premier League Player of the Season award at the age of 18, his second Premier League Golden Boot when he was still only 19, and at 21, he became the first Englishman since 1979 to win the Ballon d'Or. If it wasn't for injuries, Owen most likely would have gone down as the greatest English footballer of all time. And it was at the 1998 World Cup that that reality first began to dawn on a lot of people. England began the tournament with a strike partnership of Alan Shearer and Teddy Sheringham, but after Owen came off the bench to score against Romania during the group stage, the 18-year-old started every game that followed. His greatest moment came in the round of 16 against Argentina, when Owen made Roberto Ayala look like a 55-year-old Titus Bramble, carrying the ball half the length of the pitch, cruising past everyone, before pinging the ball into the top corner. Owen still went on to have a fantastic career with Liverpool, Real Madrid, and England, among others. But if it weren't for repeated muscle injuries, he would be England's all-time top scorer by miles, and even Harry Kane wouldn't stand a chance of catching him. 2002. Miroslav Klose. Landon Donovan is probably the obvious answer for 2002, and the American certainly deserves a very honourable mention. But I couldn't look past Miroslav Klose. Age 23 going into the World Cup in South Korea and Japan, Closer, a late bloomer himself, had played just two seasons of Bundesliga football and had scored 16 goals for Kaiserslautern during the previous term. Nonetheless, Rudi Voller started him in Germany's opening game against Saudi Arabia and Closer scored a hat-trick. Next up was the Republic of Ireland, in which Closer scored again and he made it 3-3 three from three during the group stage against Cameroon. It was a terrific introduction to the international scene for someone who was previously fairly unknown outside of Germany, and what's more, Closer scored all five of his goals at the World Cup with his head, becoming the first player to score five-headed goals at a World Cup, and I believe still the only one. It set the tone for a truly outstanding career, particularly at international level, and Closer went on to win the World Cup and become the tournament's all-time leading goalscorer in 2014. 2006. Lionel Messi. There were a lot of excellent young performers at the 2006 World Cup, Bastian Schweinsteiger and Lukas Podolski foremost among them, but both were already stars, as was Lionel Messi, you could very well argue. Although his reputation was already sky-high at Barcelona as an 18-year-old, from a purely personal perspective as someone from outside of Spain, and I suspect this will resonate with a lot of people, though I have no way of being sure about that, it was at the 2006 World Cup that Messi really announced himself to the world. He didn't start the tournament for Argentina, who were the favourites going into that World Cup, but he came off the bench to score in his World Cup debut in their second group game against Serbia and Montenegro, and he started the final group game playing against the Netherlands. He was dropped again against Mexico in the knockout stage, but was absolutely superb after being introduced off the bench, and I will never understand, for as long as I live, why he didn't start, let alone not even come off the bench, in Argentina's quarter-final defeat to Germany. Particularly in that Mexico game, though, Messi's dribbling, ball control, vision, and awareness for an 18-year-old were mesmerizing. So I think that he is the best option in 2006, even if he was already being touted for stardom. 2010. Asamoa Jan. The Black Stars were the stars of the 2010 World Cup, but it wasn't Sully Montari or Kevin Prince Boateng who proved to be their star men. It was Asamoa Jan, aged 24, who had scored just 14 goals in more than 50 games for Ren in league Gun over the previous two seasons. He was in inspired form in South Africa though, scoring in two out of the three group games, adding a third with a 93rd minute winner in the round of 16 against the United States, and almost being the hero against Uruguay in the quarterfinals, but for his penalty, striking the crossbar and bouncing over. After the tournament, Jean was signed by Sunderland, where he had one good season before seeing the dollar signs from the UAE. Now aged 36, Jean is Ghana's all-time top scorer, and despite not having represented Ghana for three years, and not having played any football at all for more than a year, he recently stated that if Ghana need him at the upcoming World Cup, 
he is fit and available. 2014, James Rodriguez. All right, this one is pure vibes on my part because James Rodriguez was a teenage wonder kid and had already spent three years at Porto and made a big move to Monaco prior to the 2014 World Cup, so he was hardly Joe Geitgen in 1950 or Josimar in 1986. By that logic, I should probably have gone with Stefan de Vrij, Memphis Depay or Bruno Martins Indy, but Rodriguez still felt like the right choice. And sometimes, you've just got to go with your gut. Having scored nine goals in Ligue 1 for Monaco the previous season, Rodriguez was arguably the star man, alongside the likes of Ian Robin and Lionel Messi, at the 2014 FIFA World Cup. Rodriguez scored in every single one of Colombia's games, going three from three in the group stage as Colombia won their group, bagging a brace against Uruguay, including one of the all-time great World Cup goals, and a penalty in that 2-1 defeat to Brazil. After the World Cup, Rodriguez was signed for £63 million by Real Madrid, but he now plays for Olympiacos, age 31. 2018. Alexander Golovin. Kylian Mbappe was the biggest star of the 2018 World Cup, though I don't think anyone was enormously surprised by that fact despite his age. Meanwhile, Benjamin Pavard was perhaps the most surprising star from France's World Cup winning side, given his relatively low profile at Stuttgart at the time. I was tempted to go with Herving Lozano here, who I'm pretty sure I predicted would be the breakout star at that World Cup on this very channel, and he did go on to make quite the impact. But ultimately, I think that the biggest breakout star was Alexander Golovin. The hosts weren't expected to do much at the 2018 World Cup, having been dreadful at Euro 2016, and CSKA Moscow midfielder Alexander Golovin was the youngest player in their squad. In Russia's opening game, though, they beat Saudi Arabia 5-0, with Golovin making two assists and scoring the final goal. Golovin also impressed against Spain and Croatia in the knockout stage, despite playing out of position, and at the end of the tournament, he was signed by Monaco for a club record fee. Age 26 now, Golovin still plays for Monaco, though he no longer plays for Russia. No one does, because they have been suspended by FIFA and UEFA, and don't have any games. That is it for today's video, which I thoroughly hope you enjoyed. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure that you're subscribed, of course, and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. And why don't you let me know in the comments who you think might be the breakout star of this upcoming World Cup. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. 